I'm Pat Ponisell here at the SAE 2014 World Congress in Detroit with Bob Gallion. He's president of business development for uh, Amprix Technologies Limited. Thanks, Bob, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Bob is also the uh, chairman of the SAE Battery Standard Steering Committee, and he uh, is a member of the SAE Motor Vehicle Council here in the U.S., and he's on the China Automotive Standards Advisory Council in China. So, Bob, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit first about your company, what it mm -hmm. does, uh, what you do, and then we can talk about some standards activity. Sure. Well, um, I left the United States uh, from the president's seat of uh, Magna Ecar to go work in uh, China with a company called Amperex Technology Limited because I saw that company as one of the biggest in the world in terms of technology and uh, the rate at which it's growing is uh, going to be one of, if not the biggest battery company in the world at some future point in time. They have a tremendous business in consumer electronics, but now it's broadening out into both automotive sector, uh, which I call transportation, and another sector we call energy storage systems. I see there's gonna be a huge convergence within the next few years between the automotive sector and the energy storage sector because they combine themselves in producing enough batteries that we store enough energy on the on the local grid network that there's a clear and a concise uh, convergence at some future point in time. Good. Uh, so, in terms of battery standards, uh, has there been a lot of recent activity? Can you focus on yes. some recent developments? Well, the Battery Standards Steering Committee was formed just a little over a year and a half to two years ago to head up what was originally contrived to be a single committee is now turned into 19. Uh, there's a large number of people in all disciplines of the um, of the market segment, uh, wh which we call batteries, and there's a lot of technology and a lot of different segments that require that are required to support a battery business. One might think, well, why why would there be so many different skill sets required? So we cover everything from safety to uh, the standards for testing, for life cycling. We also have shipping and transportation. We have secondary use. We have the recycling group. There's these 19 committees do everything from labeling to uh, end, end of life, and including a secondary, the secondary life committee is getting actively engaged now by a lot of different people. But this, this group of committees have uh, produced several uh, standards over the last few years, and it's continuing to grow rapidly. Is the focus on safety, or is it, is it more than just safety? It's more than safety. Um, I'll give you a couple of good examples. Uh, Dr. Monique Richard from Toyota heads up the uh, group of uh, the that does the material science activities for the anode and the cathode and separator systems and packaging for lithium batteries specifically and we have um, other people that uh, head up activities are outside the realm of the material sciences and more in the testing realm and packaging realm we have uh, the transportation uh, group has done a fantastic job of writing up documentations on how we properly ship and transport these uh, complex battery systems, including those that have been involved in serious car accidents. We have one group that heads that head, is headed up by one of the big three that covers the specific safety issues around battery packs that have been involved in car accidents because uh, it's not like a gas tank. This thing holds electrons, and at the end of the day, when this car has been involved in an accident, it's still got electrons in there, and it still has the potential for electrocution hazard and or fire. So it's a different type of handling situation than what we have with the traditional gas tank. Mm -hmm. And the committees address more than just lithium-ion batteries, correct? Yes, that is correct. We have one committee that's headed up by one of the largest battery manufacturers in the world, if not the biggest, that uh, his committee uh, does everything specific to lead-acid batteries for start, starting applications. Those starting applications include all segments of, of uh, heavy-duty truck, cars, and uh, agriculture, and other activities out there that require some form of a lead-acid battery. We also have one committee that's specific to the new start-stop technology. Some people call it start-stop, but it does cover what we call low voltage moving into high voltage because they're, the car companies are looking at both 12-volt systems and 48-volt systems, and we have to address both. Uh, is 48 volt really gaining? Yes, it is. More predominantly outside the United States than internal to the United States, but we are an international organization, so we have to look at the entire world. Right, right. In China, what's happening in China? China is moving very aggressively to pure electric vehicles. 
uh, it's almost as if they're jumping over the hybrid technology, even though there's a lot of hybrid technology being produced in China right now. Uh, there is a big push right now to cut down on the emissions that are going on. As we all know, the major cities in China are struggling on a daily basis, particularly Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, some of those areas where there's massive car movements and a lot of uh, energy production from coal-burning uh, energy generation stations. So there is a serious problem in China, and their government is focusing heavily on automotive uh, electrification to help uh, correct that. Uh, what's the, the, the charging infrastructure like there? Is it pretty built out? Or it's, uh, not build out? it's not built out, it, but it is something that will change very quickly. Uh, one thing that I'm finding that the Chinese culture is very good at is quick response. Uh, there's very good examples uh, even in the manufacturing plants that we have in our facility in Ningda, Fujian province in China. When I first arrived there, there were only two manufacturing plants. Now there's four, and we're building another one behind that. So that's only been in the last 22 months. <laughs> wow. Okay. How's the pollution problem in that city? Uh, where we live, the air is very clean because it's right along the coastline of the Pacific Ocean and it's protected by mountain ranges, and we do not have uh, large industrial facilities that are polluting the environment like you would have around Shanghai or Beijing. Yeah, so, so it really varies in China, doesn't it? The it varies quality. a great deal. Well, it does here, too. No different. It's no different than Los Angeles in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, it's, it's just like uh, some of the cities in China that are protected by mountain ranges. It also traps the pollution and it doesn't allow it to get out easily. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to ask you about is battery cell size. I think there was a movement to standardize that, but it didn't go very well. Is that correct? That's true. Yeah. That is true. And we have an entire committee that's supposed to be working on that. The problem is that the, the large automobile manufacturers did not want to aggressively per, pursue standardization. In fact, they have gone the opposite direction and gone more to differentiation because they're trying to get more market share for their product. But clearly, long-term standardization is the only way that electrification will be successful because it allows us to drive the cost of the product down and improve the quality through larger volume production. Uh, in terms of cell size or in other ways, standardization in other in, ways? In terms of cell size and packaging, uh, I, I believe that the car companies will eventually resolve to standard module size like they have in the, in the, in the uh, 12 volt systems. You know, as standard examples, General Motors for many years had the Group 78 side terminal battery for their cars. Chrysler had Group 34 batteries for their cars. Ford had Group 65s. And clearly they did the standardization so they could get more production volumes and different manufacturers to tool and make a more aggressive and competitive market to make their products more cost effective. Mm -hmm. And your company, Amp Amperex, does it make battery cells or are the materials for the battery cells? Both. Uh, this company is one of uh, the more vertically integrated companies and it's becoming more vertically integrated. Uh, we believe that the uh, complex that we have in Ningda, China is going to be uh, one of the bigger complexes in the world for batteries. We have uh, allocated land for not only suppliers to come in and work with us, but also customers. The uh, Chinese government uh, basically takes care of allocating the land for companies that they see as aggressive growth opportunities and uh, we're taking advantage of that by going more vertically integrated both in the supplier base and the customer base. Mm -hmm. And with the China Automotive Standards Advisory Council, the, the organization that you serve on there, what, what kind of activities are they involved in? What are, what, are, what are they trying to do? Well, they're just getting off the ground, to be honest, Patrick. They're, they have a uh, group of 10 different companies represented on this group, in, including Qatar, the Center of Automotive Technology and Research Center in China. Uh, Katark is heavily involved with uh, providing input to the Chinese government for setting the new rules and rulemaking for the Chinese automobile uh, market. Uh, Dr. Wu, who was here last year, signed an agreement with uh, uh, one of our SAE staff members, uh, uh, Jack Pokshava, and that, that agreement basically stated that we would work on strategic issues that are common to both uh, international work as well as China work. And the, the number one item, of course, is safety. The number two topic is batteries. So it uh, is near and dear to our heart that they're picking on two of the most important topics that are coming out of our committee work here in Inter SAE International. Yeah. China's, I think, kind of known as a country that likes to do things its own way. So is it sort of a challenge to the harmonization? Is that a challenge? Yes. 
Well, their homologation is somewhat different than what we have in other countries, whether it's European community or whether in North America, but the homologation is still uh, improving. Let's just say that their homologation has learned, they have learned a lot in how they put their systems together from European car manufacturers and North American car manufacturers, and quite frankly, they're doing a wonderful job of it in China. Good. Um, okay, well, thank you, Bob. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak.